when um, Louis Pasteur, the inventor of the anti-rabic vaccine, was asked, what is your preferred word in French language? He replied, enthusiasm. Well, in English, it's quite the same, enthusiasm. Because he said, enthusiasm means God being inside me and me being inside God. This evening, it's with an incredible enthusiasm that I'm with you tonight. Uh, please welcome Dr. Pierre Bello. Thank you very much. Uh, I can say you that uh, we have here tonight creme de la creme <laughs> in public health and a very high level expertise. So the chosen topic for this uh, year, Nuit des Idées, is deeply rooted in public health and obviously linked to current events we are living for the last two years. Vaccines and immunization have been developed by humans to protect them for maybe like half a millennium, and certainly for more than two centuries. It is probably one of the most cost-effective medical advances to save lives. Uh, let me tell you that uh, we all have witnessed an amazing medical revolution. On the 2019th of December 2019, a new virus is identified in China, SARS-CoV-2. On January 2nd, the full genomic sequence is online. On the 21st of December of the same year, the European Medicine Agency gave a conditional marketing authorization for Pfizer-BioNTech vaccines. It means that in less than one year uh, after the discovery of the virus, a vaccine was available for use in human population. This is really, for me, after 40 years of medicine, it's like a miracle, uh, really a miracle. One point that stood out is, why can we benefit of, from a dozen of vaccines against COVID and from nearly nothing or few against malaria, HIV, tuberculosis? So SARS-CoV-2 is a very new virus, whereas malaria, tuberculosis have been around for many centuries and HIV for decades. We have been able to develop many vaccines for this newborn virus and hardly anything for some of the oldest diseases which remain big killers. Dear panelists and moderators, please help us to understand better what are the factors that contribute to the possibility of developing efficient and effective vaccines against infectious disease. Many thanks for your attention. I wish to all of you a beautiful and interesting Nuit des Idées. It is the night of ideas, and we are here to share ideas and to hear from some of the foremost experts in health in this country. So distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome uh, to this session. My name is Anne Soy. Thank you very much for making time uh, this evening and welcome. Um, first, I would like to, we would like to hear from uh, Dr. Yaron Wolman uh, from UNICEF. So you, you're right in the middle of a really big uh, logistical effort um, at UNICEF. But, you know, even before COVID-19, UNICEF has played a key role in, you know, distributing and supplying uh, vaccines, routine vaccinations, which many of you will know and may have used, um, you know, routine vaccinations for, for children, um, for women as well. And so um, Dr. Wolman is here to come and talk about those, how important are they, and what difference have they made uh, for people? Welcome. Um, <clears throat> uh, thank you, uh, Anne. Good evening, uh, colleagues. and. Audience, I will speak very briefly about, as Anne has presented, not so much about COVID-19 vaccines, but just in, to, in order to set the stage, I will provide a little bit of background regarding immunization and vaccines as a whole, and the vaccines which are being utilized at different types, and specifically here in Kenya. As this uh, slide uh, tells us, Vaccines are the most effective public health means that manage to save the largest number of lives of children and adults all over the world, apart maybe from safe water. 
And according to the epidemiologists that made these calculations, they claim that even more life than antibiotics, really reducing the death and severe illness across the world since the first vaccines have been invented. So many hundreds of millions of lives that have been saved, and we will be discussing that very shortly. Vaccines and the immunization as a whole, apart from saving lives, they have also the capacity to really build the health system as a whole and strengthen the health system as a whole. They contribute to the health of the broader population. Of course, not only children, but the whole, you know, families, parents, communities. By increasing the health of children and saving their lives, the whole community and the whole family, of course, and the whole society benefits. It really improves the attainment of universal health coverage, which is one of the sustainable development goals and one of the main flagship initiatives of the government of Kenya, uh, as we know. And again, they contribute not only in the context of, you know, development of routine uh, programs, but they also contribute significantly to what we call outbreak response and health in emergencies. And the COVID-19 vaccines, which we will be speaking about this evening, is only one of many vaccines that have been made available as an emergency response. And among them, we can mention the Ebola vaccines, which have been developed also in record time. I was privileged to be part of that uh, as well and part of the rollout in a few countries, including in the big outbreak in uh, Sierra Leone and elsewhere. We have the vaccines for cholera, for yellow fever, for chikungunya, um, for avian influenza, meningitis, polio. So many of these outbreaks, when they occur, apart from COVID-19, uh, can be addressed through, uh, through vaccines. So very potent uh, measure that uh, public health experts and governments use in order to save lives and address public health emergencies and strengthen the health system as a whole. Don't get uh, shocked by all of these uh, words on that screen. I will be going uh, through them very, very quickly because I really would like to allow my colleagues to speak as well and also for us to have time for our discussion. But there are many, many scientific principles behind, uh, behind vaccinations and the ultimate goal of all immunization drive, again, is really to save life and to eradicate certain diseases, and vaccines have managed to do so very, very effectively so far. I will just be going through the slides because we really would like to have this enthusiastic uh, discussion and the very rich uh, presentation of my colleagues. Uh, so, so, so I will go through my presentation quickly. But we see that uh, scientifically, we have different types of uh, vaccines. I should have added here also the messenger RNA vaccines. Um, but we are talking about the more routine uh, vaccines, so it's not included here. But apart from the five types of vaccines which are mentioned here, we have also the new messenger RNA vaccines that are available for COVID-19 vaccines and maybe for other illnesses as well. And how do vaccines uh, work? The vaccines work actually by activating our immune system. And by activating our Im different components of our uh, immune system, and again, I will try to be very brief, but as human beings, we have amazing immune systems in our body, which are very sophisticated and include various components, <clears throat> which scientists call in very long uh, names and complicated explanations. But what is important is that those amazing public health measures that we have, the vaccines, manage to activate all of the different elements of the immune system of our body. And therefore, they are very effective. As our colleagues will explain, of course, you know, <laughs> the bacteria and the viruses and 
they, they, they are also, uh, you know, sophisticated. So it's not that easy to develop those vaccines. But once they are developed, they help our immune system to cope with those illnesses which are caused, again, by different viruses and bacteria. Again, what are the impact of vaccines? As I mentioned previously, they save uh, lives. They save many lives. And only the vaccine for measles, nowadays in most parts of the world it's measles and uh, rubella in one vaccine, only this one type of vaccines between 2010 and 2017, so only in seven years they managed to prevent Sorry, from 2000 to 2017, so over a period of 17 years, though only that vaccine managed to save the lives of 25.5 million children under the age of five all around the world. I think that's an amazing number. Think about it, 25.5 million lives of children younger than five years old, which have been saved during a relatively short period of time of 17 years, around the world, and the numbers are staggering when taking into consideration uh, the other types of vaccines that exist as well. The immunization improves the country's productivity and resilience and economic performance, given the fact that we have more children that grow up to be healthy and productive adults that are not suffering or have not suffered during childhood from severe illnesses and from the debilitating effects of such illnesses, if it's paralysis or, or brain damage or other illnesses or even deaths. The families are healthier, the families have more uh, economic capacity because they didn't have uh, to waste resources on providing to these children. Because in most countries, all countries, Vaccines are provided for free by the government with support of agencies like WHO and UNICEF and others, including here in Kenya. And finally, the immunization helps ensure safer and healthier world. So vaccines in general are one of really the most amazing things that as humans we manage to invent. Look at the breadth and of the number of vaccines which are available here in Kenya. So many vaccines that save so many lives here every, every year. And we have an incredibly committed uh, government in many countries, including here in Kenya, with an immunization program of the Ministry of Health that makes sure that the children and the women of all these countries, including here in Kenya, have access and benefit from these vaccines according to very, very strict uh, protocols in terms of the ages that children need to be vaccinated. And I'm sure that many of us here in the audience have young children, and we make sure that our children benefit from these vaccines. And some of us still remember that ourselves as children, we benefited from a smaller number of vaccines, but we benefited from those vaccines as well. And gradually there are more and more vaccines which are being introduced beyond the young children age, the first year of life. As we all know, there is the human papilloma virus, the HPV vaccine, which is provided to adolescent girls to protect them from cancer in, later in life. So vaccines are, being, are protecting also adults from horrible illnesses like cancer, which again is incredibly, incredibly impressive. And then we have other vaccines which are being provided to adults like, you know, travelers, vaccines for rabies, vaccines for tetanus for pregnant women, uh, vaccines for, uh, you know, specific venoms of specific poisonous uh, snakes. Other vaccines which are being developed in the world, like for chikungunya and other illnesses. So it's a very, very dynamic field which is evolving very quickly, and that is what my colleagues will be speaking on very shortly, in order to protect more children, more adolescents, and more adults from vaccine-preventable illnesses, including the very exciting topic of COVID-19 vaccines that we will be talking about, but also other vaccines that my colleagues will be speaking about more in detail 
which are extremely, extremely exciting. Thank you very much, Dr. Wallman. And, you know, how refreshing it is to see malaria among the routine vaccinations. And we know what malaria has done in our communities, don't we? I would like to bring up a question, okay? So we will be coming to you at some point. You'll be asking questions to the experts. But I also want to ask you uh, a question. Which source of information do you trust the most? When you're talking about, you know, vaccines, health, which, which source of information do you trust the most? It doesn't have to be one. So please go to your phones. Um, and you can go to that website there, www.menti.com. And then there's a code that you can use that's right up there. And you can select as many as you want. I will not campaign for the media. <laughs> Today I'm not in the media. So please, uh, we would like to know which sources of information you trust most. Ministry of Health, health organizations, health workers, social media, and broadcast, basically traditional media. Uh, many of you will remember that uh, Dr. Doc Hawk previously served as the director of HIV and AIDS department okay. at the World Health Organization and as the director the of the U.S. CDC here in Nairobi. Um, his expertise is in HIV and AIDS, tuberculosis, liver disease, and tropical diseases such as yellow fever and viral he hemorrhagic fevers. Welcome, Dr. Uh, th thank you very much. Um, you know, it's always difficult to say when does a story begin, because uh, it's often earlier than people recognize. But the sort of most frequently uh, beginning of va uh, the science of vaccinology was in the late 18th century, in the late 1700s in the United Kingdom, when uh, Edward Jenner um, he did an experiment, actually, that would be considered totally unethical today. It was recognized that uh, people who had been infected with cowpox uh, seemed to be resistant to getting smallpox, and he actually, inoc he actually inoculated cowpox into a young boy, and then later exposed the boy to smallpox, and indeed the, the child was protected. It can't be in the Alliance Francaise without talking about the great Louis Pasteur. In the late, uh, late 1800s, um, really the era of microbiology, beginning bacteriology, the germ theory, uh, sanitation, and lots of huge advances. Uh, Robert Koch discovered tuberculosis. Uh, and then in the 1900s, uh, advances in virology and molecular biology, bringing us up to the present day. And really, the, the bottom of the slide there shows some of the basic approaches to vaccines that we heard about from, uh, from Dr. Woolman. Uh, initially, very simple approaches, sort of giving the whole organism, uh, then using it uh, in killed fashion, heat inactivated, killed with detergents, or using toxins like from diphtheria. Uh, then later, sort of using bits of these organisms like the surface protein of hepatitis B, for example. And then today, more sophisticated measures, uh, sometimes using viruses that have been modified to incorporate something that will elicit immunity, uh, adenovirus vectors, for example. These are really like using viruses to shuttle uh, vaccine components into the body, really a bit like a sort of Amazon package being delivered. And then, the, as we heard about COVID vaccines, um, RNA, ribonucleic acid, messenger RNA, um, modified to actually direct the production of a protein that will um, elicit an immune response. And that's what we've seen with the COVID vaccines. So it, it really, uh, it's become more sophisticated, but the basics have remained the same for a very long time. We heard from Dr. Woolman the uh, tremendous impact in global health, particularly on child survival. Uh, really, vaccines are core to improving child survival. Uh, what the graph on the left shows is that uh, back in, um, in, in, uh, in 1990, there were something like 12 million deaths in children annually, and that's down to 5 million, which of course is still far too much. And most of those deaths actually in children under five in Africa and in South Asia. Uh, the other very important thing, I think, in global health has been the eradication efforts. 
there's a difference between eradication, elimination, and control, which I won't go into, but eradication means that the organism has gone completely from the face of the earth. And we've only managed that with one human infection, and that's smallpox. It means it simply does not exist, and it's, it's the absolute ultimate in health equity. There's, a, there's an eradication program going on for polio, but we're not there. It's vaccine-based also. Uh, we're not there, and almost eradicated doesn't count. And the only other disease that was eradicated is uh, actually a veterinary disease, rinderpest, which is a measles-like uh, virus of children. We, we always think about children when we talk, excuse me, a, 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 a measles-like uh, infection of ruminants. We always think about uh, children when we talk about vaccines, but actually they're employed across the lifespan. The table on the right and the details don't matter, but they list nine diseases that are in the CDC recommended uh, schedule for immunization for adults. Uh, and they include uh, lots of different um, uh, infections um, in special situations also. People with HIV, for example, might require special vaccines and so on, but nine different other infections. I'm glad that Dr. Woolman mentioned the issue of, uh, of human papillomavirus, HPV, because there are two other, um, two other considerations about vaccines, that not only can they prevent infection, but sometimes uh, in addition to preventing infection, or even if they don't prevent infection, they can prevent disease. Um, there are two well-known, very important cancer-causing viruses, uh, viruses that after chronic infection, after very long-standing infection, can cause cancer. One is human papillomavirus, cancer of the cervix in women, one of the commonest cancers across this continent, and uh, hepatitis B, the virus that can, uh, in chronic infection, can cause cirrhosis and liver cancer. And if you deploy those vaccines and prevent infection, you can eliminate those cancers, which is truly remarkable. Sometimes vaccines don't pre prevent infection completely, as we see with COVID, but uh, they do make severe disease and death much less likely. In other words, they attenuate infection and disease, and that's important also. We heard about vaccines and epidemics. Uh, I also was deeply involved in West Africa, and today the vaccine for uh, Ebola is part of the uh, Ebola response uh, whenever an outbreak occurs. So vaccines in these situations are used in targeted setting, in targeted fashion, not for everybody. In Ebola, they, we, we use this, uh, what, what was done for smallpox, actually, which is a ring strategy, vaccinating around cases, vaccinating contacts, contacts of contacts, and specific populations like healthcare workers. Uh, and Dr. Wolman talked about that. And then, of course, we have the COVID uh, vaccine that will be discussed. So finally, the, the, the point I was asked to make, um, vaccines for HIV, TB, malaria. My colleague, Dr. Ogutu, will talk about malaria. Um, why is it a frequently asked question? I think it's probably the most common question I've faced is, how come it is that we have a vaccine for COVID-19 in a year and HIV, uh, AIDS was described in 1981, 40 years ago. How come we had no vaccine for that? Um, it's tempting to say that uh, it's prioritization, it's money, it's interest, and that actually is not true. Um, it's biology. The, uh, there's enormous amount of efforts that have gone into developing an HIV, HIV vaccine, and it's to do with biology. It's the nature of these viruses. The problem with HIV is that if someone is infected, they become infected for life, and that's universal. And they become infected for life, and they will, if you wait long enough, progress to immune deficiency and the disease AIDS. When people do get infected with HIV, there's a very brisk immune response, very brisk, but it doesn't protect against the infection and it doesn't control the infection. And there's a whole host of biological reasons why it's difficult. High mutation rate of the virus, uh, the fact that the epitopes that elicit an immune response are hidden in sugars uh, on the surface of the virus, all sorts of other reasons. The virus actually integrates into our DNA. It becomes part of our own genetic material uh, and so on and so forth. 
the National Institutes of Health, um, which is the of the United States government, the sister agency to CDC, it's the largest funder of medical research in the world. They spend about a billion dollars a year trying to develop uh, on the science of HIV vaccinology. There's been several large-scale trials, but we have not been able to come up with a successful product, and it's not for lack of trying. Um, there's a rather embarrassing um, a press um, interview way back in 1984 with the American Minister of Health uh, announcing research advances in the US and promising an HIV vaccine within two years. And that was back in 84. And the running joke is, you know, well, we'll have a vaccine in 10 years, just as has been the case for the last 30 years. It's biology. And what we're trying to do with HIV is a vaccine is actually do better than nature itself. You get COVID, you get some immunity that is protective. You get measles, you won't get it again. With HIV, we have to do better than nature itself. And to some extent, that's true for malaria and tuberculosis, and we'll hear about that. A final comment, another important area where vaccines are beginning to show their importance is in the whole issue of antimicrobial resistance. Uh, antibiotic resistance uh, is becoming very prevalent, is becoming a major cause of death. And there are certain infections that are actually on the verge of being untreatable. We see it with some strains of tuberculosis, uh, gonorrhea, some uh, intestinal infections, uh, typhoid, uh, in parts of the world, and vaccines have a potential role if we could develop them to overcome that particular problem. So let me stop there. I look forward to the other comments from uh, my colleagues and look forward to the discussion. Thank you. So we're back at this page. A question for you. If you haven't gone to menti.com uh, yet, uh, please uh, answer that question, and then we will have the results at the end of uh, this session. Um, I would like to now turn to COVID-19. It's the greatest uh, challenge of our time. And, you know, researchers have been building, you have seen the history as was presented by Dr. De Kock, and they have built on this foundation um, and the extensive research and development done by scientists across the world uh, to confront this new challenge. Uh, it's more than two years now, but we have already a number of vaccines. And I was just sharing that um, last week I got my booster shot. And I was really surprised because I was not planning to have it. But I was just leaving the supermarket and they were right there. Truly, truly impressive. And I said, oh, you, can I get a booster shot? And they said, yes. Which one do you want? You know, you have choice. I sat down and within less than three minutes I was done and I was off. Uh, to go home. Uh, and, you know, the, the man who has been really at the heart of, you know, helping to bring these vaccines here and developing the policies uh, of, you know, their deployment, you know, it's, it's such a complicated thing, um, is Dr. Ahwale, Dr. Willis Ahwale from the Ministry of um, Health. And, you know, many of you will remember that he also played a key role also in malaria, uh, in, you know, the response uh, to malaria in the country. He's an expert in tropical diseases, uh, tropical medicine with over 25 years experience in management and technical roles and uh, the provision of healthcare services, managing donor-funded uh, disease control programs, infectious disease uh, prevention and control health informatics, and the list goes on and on. Uh, Karibu sana, Daktari. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne and all colleagues. A good evening. Now, the question is, why many vaccines in a short span? There is a counter question. In the midst of COVID, what of if it took seven to ten years to develop a vaccine? To me, that's even a more important question. And let me answer that one. I would not be here. Most likely I would have been buried in a shallow grave nearby. You would not be there. This function might not have been there because COVID is unrelenting, highly infectious. So it is good that we got vaccines within a very short time. Thanks to technological advancements. 
So one of the reasons is that first and foremost, we've been told about the development of vaccines. And I just want to emphasize all vaccines must undergo stages of development, regulatory review and approval, and safety monitoring. The COVID vaccines went through that. There was no shortcut. There must be scientific and clinical evidence from cl uh, clinical trials, human trials, and also manufacturing information. That also happened with COVID-19 vaccines. One has to look at efficacy, level of protection. What is, is it saving? And as these vaccines started becoming available, data was required of at least 15,000 people who must have received the vaccine and this must vaccine must have attained good manufacturing practices as prescribed by WHO. So these steps were not, uh, there was no shortcut. Now, what made that uh, possible? First and foremost, the scientists used previous platform and research finding from other coronaviruses. You know now we have three coronaviruses. There's the SARS-CoV-1, that causes severe acute respiratory syndrome. Then we have the Middle East respiratory syndrome, and then the SARS-CoV-2 that causes COVID-19. We should be worried that in a short span of 20 years, we have three coronaviruses. We may be thinking of other variants, we could end up with another coronavirus. But so there was an advantage that already there was work of developing uh, vaccines for other coronaviruses. And I will not go into the different types that has been said, but there were different platforms, including the nucleic acid platform. There was also uh, the, the, the nucleic acid platform, in particular messenger RNA, which was being used uh, following the Ebola outbreak in 2014. Now, we have the so-called emergency use authorization, which basically means that the findings from the clinical trials show protection, they show benefit. Here were vaccines that were preventing severe disease and death. So once you give emergency authorization, you are required to continue reporting. You have to set up structures. You have to continue monitoring adverse events. You have to investigate. And this data is collected before you get what you call full market authorization. So these vaccines, I, I, I think the FDA has given Pfizer and very soon Moderna, but many of them, and here in Kenya, they are still under emergency use authorization, and therefore very close monitoring continues to be done. Now, vaccines for the future. Anne has just said she walked in and got a booster shot. That's very good. Now people are asking us, you people and booster. Now third one, fourth one, fifth I. We are going to get tired, eh? So what are we considering for the future? They must have a high impact on prevention of infection and transmission. I think the issue of transmission is going to become very key, that a vaccine that has that impact is really going to be one we want to see. If it can prevent the infection, even better. They must also continue to prevent severe disease and death. They should also be based on circulating strains of the coronavirus. They are different strains. So you don't want a vaccine that you are told this one is not effective against the strains that is the most predominant in Kenya or whichever region we are talking about. They should elicit immune responses that are broad, strong, and long-lasting. Long-lasting to address the issues of fatigue from the number of doses that one would have to really uh, get. They should also address potential mutations. There are mutations of, uh, of concern. Uh, scientists are able to start predicting certain mutations. And there are vaccines that can predict those potential mutations and be able to address them would be what we want to see. They must also be easily accessible to ensure equity. So even as these vaccines are developed, we want them to be in a situation that even countries uh, developing countries, uh, uh, resource limited uh, constrained countries must be able to access them. And therefore the issue of uh, waiving of patents starts becoming important so that they can support 
the local manufacturing of these vaccines across the entire globe so that we don't end up in that situation we were last year that even when we had money, we could not access these vaccines. So for me, uh, these were just the kind of comments I wanted to make, uh, but then also say currently we have enough doses and from tomorrow, in fact, we will move very close to every homestead to ensure people get vaccinated. Thank you. Just by way of introduction, allow me to introduce you, uh, Dr. Ogutu. Uh, Dr. Ogutu, as I mentioned previously, is the uh, Chief Research Officer at uh, Kemri, and he has been at the forefront of finding answers for us uh, dealing with malaria, uh, which is you know, one of the biggest killer diseases for especially children under five uh, here in the country. And Dr. Ogutu is a certified physician, investigator of the Association of uh, the Clinical Research Professionals, a registered pediatrician, and a member of the Expert Committee on Clinical Trials at the Pharmacy and Poisons Board. Uh, he has extensive experience in malaria research and has been involved, as I mentioned, in the malaria vaccine and drug trials. So really the best person to talk about uh, malaria, Karibu Sana. Money just possibly to get you where we are with the malaria as a disease. The only thing I can tell you, this is a parasite. To date, we still don't understand pretty well. And that has caused the delay of all possibly developing the vaccines. And it's also one of the diseases that we have to now, we still rely on an 18th century diagnostic tool for 21st century treatments. So that's how bad we are doing. And the main problem around the vaccine developing malaria is basically the biology. The malaria parasite is like a very well-trained gorilla agent in the forest <laughs> because it had so many stages and in every stage it is it has so many courts to really know which court really if you hit you are going to hit it has been the biggest problem the best that possibly happened last year which was not announced it was the first time we were able to synthesize malaria stage that gets into the human being in the lab without using a mosquito. Now, a scenario company can manufacture sporozoids in the lab without the use of a mosquito, and that is going to be quite useful. We thought that when we had the sporozoid, hold of it, and then change it, attenuate it, we would get a vaccine. It was very promising, but two years ago, when we tried that candidate on children in Siaya, it fell flat on its face that the whole sporozoid could not work as a vaccine candidate. And that's how possibly humbling the whole process have been. The RTSS, as you know, took a long path and that was possibly around, because the first trial that showed that that candidate could work was in 1987. And it got approved and registered in 2015, when the EMA said that we have a vaccine against the parasitic disease. By the time it was being registered or being approved, there had been 62 clinical trials done. So that's how inefficient our system of product development has been. And I think those are some of the lessons we have learned with Ebola and COVID-19, that we can compress all this over a short period of time. And for COVID, we can see all the stars were aligned, but we'll discuss that later for us to have had the miracle that happened. And some of the things that happened with COVID-19 are going to possibly accelerate the next generation of malaria vaccine development. The aim is still that by 2030, we'll have possibly a more efficacious, around 75% efficacious malaria vaccine, which will be the second generation. We think we have phase two results on some of the candidates, promising, but we are not talking much because Malaria parasite has been a humbler most of the time. When you think you are close, that's when you fall flat on your face. And nobody wants to talk before you really have the data with you. And these are just because the biology is rather 
strange. We still don't fully understand it, and it changes. Because the most vulnerable part of the parasite is the time between the time it is injected into your skin and the time it reaches the liver. And the parasite is so efficient that that is the stage in the human body that is very short. And where it passes through is where you can't catch it easily, and the immune system, it evades literally throughout before it reaches the liver. And these are some of the things that makes getting a vaccine for some of this, because as Dr. DeCock said, most of the vaccines we have, nature already had them for us. We just repackaged it and got it. But here, for parasitic diseases, because you'll find that these are the microorganisms that are able to survive in the human body within immune cells, the cells that actually drive our immune system, which means they have a, me a mechanism of possibly evading and paralyzing your immune system that it cannot be recognized. And until we really find that out, we hope with technology we are going to get much better, and possibly that might open the gates for getting these vaccines for other parasites. But I think that's, but knowing what we have seen and what COVID has opened space, as much as you guys are complaining that nucleus acid platform for developed vaccines, you're having problems with it. I think the scientific community we had a lot of problems with it in the last 10 years, 10, 15 years. As a platform, we kept discussing when can we make this move to human trials. But when COVID came in, it allowed us to make that jump because of the immense public disaster that was ahead. And the DNA or nucleic acid vaccines were moved to the next level and worked. And this is going to be possibly a platform that now we might use for some of these diseases. And I think with the accelerated platform that now we have from these epidemics, we are likely to see much more advancement and possibly move the next level that we might get vaccines for the disease. Because no matter what happens, the only intervention that makes us, the health professionals, talk health is a vaccine. Because the vaccine is the only thing that we give you that keeps you away from the hospital. The drugs are for a failed health system because you have already gotten sick, so we have to take care of you. So we love taking drugs, but vaccines are the ultimate thing that are going to keep you at home and make you productive. And I think that's why all efforts for infectious disease, if you can, is to get a vaccine that will ultimately possibly move you towards eradication if you can get that. Thank you. The rest will follow on our discussion. So, you know, there's so many questions running through my mind right now, and, you know, many of them have also already been answered uh, by our experts. You know, it's, it's a question of biology. It is not uh, that scientists don't want to find a solution for HIV or, you know, funding. Uh, but first, let's talk about communities. Um, it's interesting that, uh, you know, the Ebola vaccine has been mentioned here during the presentations. Uh, I was in Mbandaka, which is uh, the western side of the Democratic Republic of Congo, when the first person received the Ebola vaccine. Um, and there was such a good uptake. But then later, there was an outbreak in the east. And I spoke to people who confessed to me, and they said that, you know, as soon as the outbreak was confirmed, they were running into the forest because suddenly there was an influx of uh, people who had come to say they were helping them, but they were accusing them of bringing the Ebola. And so every time we drove into the villages, the children would point at us and say, Ebola, Eb there's Ebola, yeah? Um, so it's... It's fascinating when you're dealing with communities. So the scientists invest a lot of time and their knowledge to find the solution, and finally there is a solution. Let's take it to the people, and then they start running uh, to the forest. W what happens, you know, in, during that transition? I mean, I think, first of all, thank you for having me here today. Um, there Perhaps is a... I should introduce oh, you first. Sorry. Yeah, I should, do, <laughs> uh, I should do the honors of introducing you. So, uh, Lolan Gong is a global public health uh, expert. She works at uh, AMREF uh, Africa Health, and, you know, her expertise really is in epidemiology, which is, um, and also dealing with uh, communities. When it comes to 
public health. It is about the public, it is about communities, and that is her expertise. That is why I ask her that question. Uh, how do you bridge this gap between uh, the scientists and the communities? No, absolutely, and it's a very good question. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for having me. Um, I'm actually extremely excited to be the only one who's going to speak about communities and how we get interventions to communities. Um, not to say we don't love our scientists, of course we do, that is my background. <laughs> um, but I get very excited about communities, and, and it's because I truly believe for everything we do, it's for you and I. And I always want to define what communities mean, right? I think in some respect, I mean, community, that term communities has, a bit, has, has been a bit downgraded, right? You think of the undeserved and so on. But communities are really you and I. It's me, it's you, your mother, your father, your neighbor, et cetera, et cetera. So when we think of interventions, and we think of how to get them to you, to myself, we think of the very, very basic reasons why those interventions need to get to you. I really like Anne's um, example when she said, you know, she walked outside of a supermarket and, you know, people were there offering her the booster shot. That is what we in public health are supposed to do. We're supposed to ensure that medical services, including immunization, comes as close to you as possible. So when we talk about the vaccine, we have to talk about all the enabling environments, I mean, all the enabling environmental factors to ensure that you get vaccinated. The vaccine is what you have in the vial. Vaccination is now the health system. So it is basic primary care services. Where do you get them from, right? When we talk about integration, you remember Dr. Um, Wallman's um, first, no, maybe it was your third slide, which had health systems, and you saw vaccines sort of at the bottom and everything kind of growing out of it. So that's that integration. So it's really looking at what are all those factors that we have to have in place to make sure that you get immunized. And so part of the work that we do is to not only come up with those approaches, so you hear risk communication. At the beginning of COVID, a lot of you heard, um, saw the ads for commercial corona, right? I mean, yes. And so that was really around how do we ensure that we're giving you the messages you need. You know, what is COVID? How do you prevent it? Wash your hands, wear your mask, et cetera, et cetera. Those are the approaches to getting service to you, to you and I. Um, then the second part when we um, talk about community approaches is also um, really ensuring that our communities understand. Um, there's been a lot of talk around vaccine hesitancy. And so every time I hear that, I go to the root cause. So why would a community be hesitant? Um, you saw the really long list of vaccines. I mean, I don't know how many vaccine vaccines I've had, but I've had every single childhood vaccination, had my COVID vaccine, of course. Um, and so it's, there's, a really, we, we ha it's, it's extremely important for us in public health to ensure that you also understand, um, you know, why you need to get your COVID vaccination, where to get your vaccination from, and everything else that we do to ensure that that happens. So our risk communication is really around all those messages, preparing you, ensuring that when the vaccination is there, as Dr. Um, Akwale mentioned, um, when the vaccination is there, you do get vaccinated. Immunization does save lives. It builds a healthy world for all of us. And I, I know this is like beating a broken record. Um, none of us will be safe till all of us are safe, right? So this is one of the reasons why the community becomes extremely important because without you and I going to get vaccinated, all of this work that our wonderful scientists have been doing and all of this data they've been churning out in looking at so many different types of technology to manufacture vaccines will be lost. And all of it is to protect you and I. So thank, thank you. Thank you Anne. very much, Lolem. Uh, and really, you know, thank you. 
And also when we're talking about communities, you know, before we, got, we, we get to the communities, there's also another constituency that plays a critical role uh, when it comes to vaccines. The politicians, the policy makers, uh, the decision makers, even when it comes to allocating uh, the money. Uh, how do you go about that? And before I come back to you, uh, Lolem, perhaps I can throw this question uh, to Dr. Hwale because you're dealing with the policy uh, level decisions. Just paint a picture of what you know, the rollout of vaccines uh, has been like here in Kenya, getting them uh, from the manufacturers and, you know, bringing them up, up to the communities, up to the supermarket where I got uh, my booster shot. Okay. Yeah, th thank you very much. Of course, vaccines are life-saving. And, and I'll step back a few years back uh, when one time, as a sector, we were defending our budget, uh, and as you know, the population growth in this country is like 1.2 million new births per year. And therefore, in terms of planning, you would want to make sure you have another 1.2. If it was 1 million, the next year would be like 1.2 million. So you'd, need, you'd have more children and you need them vaccinated. But then at that time, Treasury told us you, we don't just have money. And the question we asked is, how will we choose which child not to vaccinate and which one to vaccinate? We put a very strong case for resources. Now, coming to COVID, uh, the issue of political leadership is important. Early this, uh, in the last year when we started, you could see that immediately the political leaders, starting with His Excellency, the President, were vaccinated. The following week, we had a double number of people getting vaccinated. Governors and others uh, took place, uh, also got vaccinated. Now, when it comes, therefore, then to resources, uh, the experience we've had is that uh, we went to cabinet, uh, defended the good thing everybody supported. Obviously, there was nobody opposing the need to have more resources for vaccines. And if, even in today's paper, you saw even the supplementary budget, there is money to buy the vaccines. Uh, but, uh, what is therefore more important is that access to the communities and therefore resources that would ensure sustained access within communities within budgets at the county level is something that then we need to consider in terms of policy. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. And, um, you know, this is a question that I would like to throw to every panelist. Dr. De Kock, you have been also, you know, right in the middle of um, dealing with the policy issues, but at the same time, as a scientist, you're dealing with the science. So how do you balance? Thank you. I mean, firstly, obviously you have to get the science right. And I, I find it pretty distressing how globally uh, sometimes the whole issues have become so politicized or um, really uh, miscommunicated through social media, through particular pressure groups. But it's, it's what I think has been particularly uh, dis destructive actually is the politicization globally of this this whole issue because in many ways COVID-19 is actually pretty straightforward um, for you know for uh, as, a, as a researcher as a physician who has actually worked in in public health and policy uh, normative norm setting bodies it's extremely important that uh, you know you be able to communicate that evidence and that science, communicate its practical implications in in words that not only the public understands, communities understand, but that the decision makers understand why it's important. Because just doing the science and getting your paper published may be good for your scientific career, but it's it's not enough. Absolutely. And um, Dr. Oguto, as a scientist yourself, uh, you know, you're very busy in the laboratory trying to find solutions, but you also need money uh, for that. And those political solutions, those political decisions affect you, policy decisions affect you. So what role do you play as a scientist? Because this is all about vaccine development, isn't it? It affects vaccine development. How important is it and how do you deal with it as a scientist? Okay, thank you very much. And uh this is one thing that you have to confront every time you are thinking of because I think at the end of the day you are working for the public because as one of the former directors of this CDC, US CDC said that if you choose to work in global health, don't expect to be acknowledged, you will get satisfaction and don't expect to be a billionaire. 
and that's what it means working in global health because well we have <laughs> we have researchers now who may well be <laughs> no occasionally <laughs> if you COVID. might have worked and bump into a pattern that leads to something else that possibly must make you one but i think one of the things that we are not devoid of that like if you look at the issue of the malaria vaccine i got in the landscape because by 2006 there was a prospect that we might be going into a la possibly a final stage in developing a malaria vaccine. The big question was for who and who will afford it. So all, all of us who are working on this space said, okay, somebody has to go and defend the dollars for the malaria vaccine. If we have it, how will the communities get it? So at that time, there was the, there's a committee that seeks every two years to review the vaccine status of the world, which disease requires a vaccine, which vaccine is closer to the, to the dog, and that's the Global Vaccine Research and Immunization Forum. So they meet every two years. So I had the disadvantage of being the guinea pig to defend the malaria constituency at this meeting and put a case that there's a malaria vaccine coming. We need money ring fenced so that if it becomes available, we can have it available to the communities. And that's the time it was accept accepted. And then by the following year, we had it on the table. And Gavi had to start looking for money, possibly that if this becomes available. And this was done way ahead. The vaccine got approved in 2015. So that's how down, even as researchers, we have to, we have to basically have to get down to that because the main thing was, at least there are players that are coming and you're working on developing the vaccine. Mm -hmm. But you have to make sure that you, you work with the policy makers and ensure that you possibly can have what it takes to deliver this to the communities. And uh, scientists, we are not totally living in isolation. We sit in the technical committees with the policy makers and also the financials at the same time. And that's the only way you can see what they need and what they are doing. We worked closely with Akwale. He was sitting on the police, heading the malaria program. We have known one another for, from childhood, but I was sitting on the research side, but we were working for the Kenyan population. And that's what, some of the things that possibly you have to do. And I think that's where the rubber meets the road is that, who are you working for? And why are you doing the science that you are doing? If it is not going to have an impact, then it is an experiment. What I'm hearing you say, Dr. Ogutu, and thank you for that, is it's about collaboration. And Dr. Wallman, you deal with that kind of collaboration, you know, on a larger scale, on an international scale. Just paint a picture of, you know, how things are before you're able to, you know, get these routine vaccines uh, to every part, everyone that needs them. You know, what, what kind of a process uh, does it go through? Um, thank you, Henry. <clears throat> It's a very good question, and actually I'll be happy to try and answer actually specifically regarding the COVID-19 vaccines and the global architecture of collaborations that enables more and more vaccines to reach more and more people across the world. Uh, as we all know, it's not yet uh, very equitable, but it's getting uh, better. One of the great things in being a public health uh, practitioner, and I think many of us here uh, started as uh, physicians, clinicians, you know, pediatricians, some of us, including myself, and then our interest shifted to public health, because in public health, we can really support making an impact on the whole population. Um, and as my colleague has just mentioned, Dr. Mguto, we are all servants, public service servants, in order to be able to bring this public good to the largest numbers of beneficiaries. One of the most amazing things in, COVID, in the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, over the past two years, apart from the politicization that Dr. De Kock has already mentioned, and I think all of us are aware of that, and unfortunately a lot of uh, divisiveness through social media, but also a lot of positive things, a lot of collaboration very quickly, there were several international organizations or international conglomerates of organizations that has been formed 
in order to bring together all of the global capacity across the globe in order to do the research together, in order to manufacture vaccines, and in order to gradually more and more make those vaccines available to larger proportions of the population across the world. Dr. de Kock has mentioned in his presentation that in early January 2020, only a few weeks after the virus has been discovered in China, the whole uh, genome of that virus has been mapped and has been put in the public health, in the public arena basically, made accessible to researchers across the world, which is probably one of the reasons why the vaccine has been developed so quickly. The technology allowed researchers around the world to work together in order to develop the vaccines. And the vaccines, as we all know, and as has been mentioned by Dr. de Kock, have been made available in record time. Very quickly after that happened in December 2020, that the first vaccine started receiving emergency authorization for utilization, COVAX has been put in place. COVAX is an organization with membership by WHO, UNICEF, and other organizations working together, including CDC and other organizations working together in order to ensure that these vaccines are procured in large quantities and made available to the most uh, needy countries across the world. Unfortunately, we have also seen that many governments, first of all, took care of their citizens, and I think many of us can probably relate to that, even if we don't agree, at least we can understand that governments are accountable to their citizens. But at the same time, governments have been putting forward more and more the vaccines, making sure that these vaccines are available to countries across the world. I'm very proud to be working with, uh, for an organization called UNICEF, which is a United Nations uh, children's uh, agency. But UNICEF managed to get in touch with manufacturers around the world and to contract them to make sure that once these vaccines are made available, large volumes are being procured and being distributed to many countries, including Kenya. And very rapidly, there was a global mechanism that was put in place to ensure that all of these vaccines, as soon as they are authorized by WHO, by one of the main authorizing bodies, like the FDA in the United States, or like the European body, um, very quickly, there are contracting modalities that are being put in place, and a partnership which is being put in place globally in order to make sure that these vaccines are made available. It happened gradually, and it's still happening more and more rapidly. But even here in Kenya, one of the real um, joys in working in this domain is being able to work with colleagues from so many different sectors, from the government, like Dr. Akwale and his team, USAID colleagues, CDC colleagues, WHO colleagues, civil society organizations like AMREF and many others, many foundations which are working globally and here in Kenya, everybody working together in order to really bring this public good, and vaccines are public good. These are assets for the public that may, all of these uh, organizations are working together in partnership in order to bring and make them available to communities and populations uh, around the world, including, uh, including here in Kenya. Thank you so very much. So many positives, many positives, many optimistic perspectives and learnings from uh, partnerships in order to work together and make uh, vaccines available, especially for COVID-19. Thank Indeed. Thank you very much uh, for that contribution. We would like to take your questions now. Um, and there's a hand that was just waiting to go yeah. up. <laughs> uh, can we have a microphone uh, close to her? Um, can we see who else? Yes, over there and at the back. So we'll take three uh, first. Please introduce yourself and say your question. And let us know if you would like to direct it specifically uh, to, to a specific panelists. Do 
Do we have a microphone? Yes, it's coming. We can start there, right there where you are. Uh, yes, but she was first. You have seen. Yes, we will take her question. We will take her question. I'm not forgetting you, ma'am. Okay, ladies first, you win. Just hold it for her. Okay, that's fine. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for having us. My name is Anne. It's a mere coincidence that the moderator my name is called Anne. Yes, uh, so my question, I, I feel like it's directed to Ms. Lolem, but anyone can answer. Uh, my question is on vaccine justice. Apart from access and availability to and adoption and adoption maybe to um, communities, what other factors make up vaccine justice, and what are the specifically? I'm interested in the cultural factors that inhibit uh, vaccine justice and the geopolitical factors that inhibit uh, vaccine justice, um, and you, you know, like much. the vaccine flow and porosity into communities because communities are very nuanced and then maybe the second question we will take one I? for now we okay. may come back to you later could we take a question from him please uh, he had his hand up just raise your hand so that um, our ushers can uh, can see you and come to you so we'll take his question and then right at the back there there's another question so that's a question for Lolem Yes, we can hear you. Uh, thank you for the great presentations. Um, my name is Ian Gardner. I work for Oriel Global Health. Um, we work in neglected tropical diseases, and we've seen that reaching good quality coverage levels for mass drug administration, 84 to 90% coverage, often takes many years to reach that point. That's improving the supply chain, improving community sensitization, and overall program capacity. I'd like to hear from the panel, what do you feel would be the um, level of coverage for vaccine and the time taken to reach that coverage to be considered a successful campaign in Kenya? Thank you very much. One more question at the back. Keep, keep your hand up so that um, the microphone can get to you. Please tell us your name and ask the question. Uh, good evening. My name is Ndusi. I'm a medical student at the University of Nairobi and also a member of AFREM. So my question pertains to the medical legal framework and the financial model that has been used to develop vaccines during this pandemic. Um, we've basically seen like uh, an expedited process when it comes to the approval of some of these vaccines. Um, processes that could typically take years have taken um, like months, uh, as you previously mentioned. And the financial models have also been different. Like previously, um, funding for vaccines um, had its own scarcity, but we've now witnessed different financial models. We've had governments actually financing like companies to develop vaccines. We've had public-private partnerships such as Gavi, Ayavi, and even like um, sovereign funds like from, from Norway and even the Bank of England are bankrolling some of these um, endeavors. And even venture capitalists and private equity firms have financed um, vaccine development in some of these countries. And so my question is, do you think that these financial models and these medical legal frameworks will actually be perpetuated in the next decades? Or do you think that um, they're basically like a means to, uh, to solve this need uh, during this pandemic? Thank you very much for those questions. Very good questions. Uh, first of all, um, Anne is asking about vaccine justice. Lolem. Okay, yes. possibly I'll possibly try to give you a, an in initial chunk on this, looking at the scientific development bit of it before my colleagues come in. And 
what I would, if you are looking on the medical legal, because I think the globe has been in a crisis, but that has not been expounded. When Dr. DeCock talked of antibiotic drug resistance, we are actually facing a crisis on antibiotics globally. And this is because of the model for developing antibiotics, which has been that it is the big pharma that were left to develop antibiotics, but you cannot make money from antibiotics. So they have shied away from it. Because this is a public health good. And if somebody is not going to subsidize it, the development of these antibiotics, then we are not going to have them. And if we don't have them, we'll have more people dying from infections. And I think these are some of the things now what has happened, we have several public-private partnerships that have been created to accelerate the development of some of these commodities. Now we have GADP, which is currently stimulating the antibiotic development. For diseases of poverty, which some of them was like malaria and other neglected tropical diseases, we have several public-private partnerships that are catalyzing that space because if you leave it for the private sector to drive it, the returns on these are fairly on the lower side. So it will not attract investment. And the value of death will make any big pharma shy away from developing these products. And that's the same thing that possibly look, when we are looking at things, that that's what we need to look at and the model. And I think we have to see product development for public health good as a communal thing that will involve both the private and public sector coming together. COVID has done it, and I don't think we need to track back, because if it was not done, we wouldn't be where we are today. The issue of justice is something that I think is something that we are going to walk with time to see where it is. Because if we talk of justice, and even my colleague, Dr. Kole, talked of we need to waive patent. If you waive patent, are you going to kill innovation? Because people do things for a purpose. So these are things that, the attentions that we have to work over time. You want to give justice to the community, but you want to just give justice to those who are developing the products. And that's a place of tension that, who subsidizes the development so that at the end of the day, these products can be cheap and be affordable when they're supposed to have a patent. That's because a very fascinating, um way to put it, you know, Absolutely. where to strike the balance about, you know, justice for also the developers. Yeah. Uh, very interesting, but just to take you, take us back to the question of um, the funding models. Dr. Dukok, I don't know whether you'd like to comment on that. Uh, you know, we have seen the world come together to tackle COVID-19. Is it sustainable? Thank you. Um, the best definition of social justice uh, that I know and that I use is that it's a fair distribution of the benefits and burdens of society. I hadn't heard the term vaccine justice previously. It's a good term. We speak also, for example, today of environmental justice, particularly in relation to climate change, which is not equally impactful around the world. Um, the, I presume that by vaccine justice we mean a fair distribution of vaccines around the world. Um, but there's more to this story than just justice because actually what we need is the world to be vaccinated to get on top of this pandemic. And the understandably in some ways, you know, each country for itself that we have seen is also profoundly counterproductive because the emergence of variants of concern for COVID, new variants, which are at risk of escaping our vaccines, escaping our, some of our therapeutics and our diagnostics, um, is driven by transmission. And uh, in a way, I, I worry that actually we may be in the worst of all worlds because we don't have enough vaccine coverage to prevent, to really contain the pandemic, and yet we have quite a lot that drives uh, evolution in the virus. Uh, so in some ways, <laughs> we, we may actually be in the worst of all worlds, and it's absolutely critical that we vaccinate the world. So there's, it's not only about justice, it's actually about self-interest. And that is, I have found, a profound disappointment in uh, how the world has reacted. Um, I also am disappointed <laughs> that 
the World Health Organization really has tried. They really have tried, and I, I really commend my colleagues there. But we don't have a global COVID control program, and I don't really know why not. Um, if we have a global program, we did have for a long time now a global program to control AIDS. Um, we don't have that for COVID. And I think there's many lessons from HIV and from the Ebola pandemic, the Ebola epidemic in West Africa. I think there's many lessons that we have not carried over. But uh, the issue of funding, um, I, there isn't one mechanism. I think we have a lot to learn from HIV in terms of, you know, go back to the days of when antiretrovirals were first introduced. Huge injustice. The patients were in the south, the drugs were in the north. But look what's happened. I don't think there's one model. I don't think there's one answer. And it's a bit of a mess. And I hope we can do better than we've done. But I, I would support some of the comments uh, Dr. Agutu just made. And, you know, it's a learning experience. The world will be very different after COVID. There is a silver lining to this cloud that there will be certain things that are better. Um, but uh, we have a ways to go. Thank you very much, Dr. De Kock. Really sobering uh, perspectives there. Uh, and just to come back uh, to the question of... Um, you know, the level of coverage of vaccines, for it to be considered a success. I think I'll throw this question to Dr. Hwale. Um, what is your target? You know, as you roll out these vaccines, at what point will you say it is a success? Yeah, so uh, as we began our campaign, of course, availability of vaccine was a very big challenge. But we know that when you have wide coverage, then you start protecting even people within communities who are not taking the vaccines. You know, like even in Kenya now, we are not giving vaccines to ages 1 to 15, uh, yet they can, uh, still a number of them can get infected and can get severe disease. But to reduce that transmission, then you need wide coverage. So uh, starting especially this month, and you will hear more tomorrow, the government really is now putting in measures to see that we vaccinate as many people as quickly as possible. Our aim now is to vaccinate 70% of the adult population by end of June this year. Uh, that means uh, 19 million adults. If you go and look at your records, we are now approaching 6 million adults fully vaccinated, so we still have 13 million. Uh, and we will be deploying our community structures and our national government administrative officers to actually uh, support the community mobilization efforts. Uh, since now we have very close to um, the many doses available in this country. Uh, so our aim is to reach the herd immunity. Uh, we are targeting at anything between 60 to 70% coverage uh, of the population by the end of the year. Uh, we are hoping that that impact of reduced community transmission will be there, but I must also say I think it could vary from one infectious disease to another and we'll be doing a lot of lessons. This epidemic is also different from different regions of the globe. Uh, so we'll, we, we, a very strong monitoring evaluation and surveillance system that would start telling us the impact as we go across the coverage uh, bands will be very uh, useful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Akwale. And now to Lolem, um, on the question of uh, vaccine justice. Mm -hmm. What's your comment on that? I, um, so probably the same assumption as Dr. De Kock, um, De Kock had in terms of how do we define vaccine justice. I think you are referring to vaccine equity. I wanted to clarify that before responding. And so when we talk about equitable vaccine distribution, of course, we look at affordability and access. And you're very right, communities are very nuanced, right? And that's why in the beginning I said it's very important that the community interventions are, it's important to also co-create those interventions with communities. So when communities understand it, then communities are able to access those vaccines. The other, sorry, I said equitable affordability, accessibility, um, 
so so the the other um, so so accessibility is all in this community education and so on. Then the affordability aspect of it, which some colleagues have already touched on. Of course, it deals with the financial models on one part of it. And yes, the gentleman in the back is absolutely right. There's um, Gavi. We're all familiar with Gavi. Um, we're also familiar familiar with some of the bilateral. Um, agreements that have been made. And we also know this AVAT, which is the Africa Centers for Disease Control's um, own financing model. So when we now look at that affordability aspect, there's several things to that. So it's one, what fiscal space do our governments have to actually buy their own vaccines? I think that's a very important question. As we know in a significant number of African countries, our health budget is funded by external donors. That is unacceptable. And I think this pandemic has shown us that. We can't con continue to do this, right? Um, I used to work in DRC. DRC, about 70% of DRC's budget, health budget, was funded by external parties. So now what happens in a crisis when external parties decide we will now look inward, right? So then we're stuck. So I think it will be really interesting to look at what are the new sustainable financial models. I'm not a health economist, so I have no examples to offer, but it speaks to the affordability piece. And then when we also talk about affordability, particularly now, and yes, countries have bought whatever their supplies will be for the COVID vaccine and are reserved. But I think that global debate is very important around how much did you reserve for what you need? We can still hear oh, you. Oh, good. I'm very loud, so that's fine. So it's how much do you need for what you've reserved, right? So if I only need 4 million vaccines, why am I reserving 16 million? That is a debate we must have, right? And I think that's the type of pressure that communities must even, must even put on their leaders from the grassroots, and then you hopefully have this sort of thing, that effect that goes all the way to the top Indeed. on our leadership so, as well. So we also have a role to play, mm -hmm. you know, as members of the public uh, to, you know, take these issues up uh, with our leaders. I would like to bring in uh, Dr. Wallman, uh, just on in a mix of these issues, because the question was asked about vaccine justice, but we've just had the correction that is actually vaccine equity. And, you know, at UNICEF, you, you know, you, you, you are in the middle of all this, trying to get vaccines. At some point, it was so difficult to get them. There was demand, uh, but the supply was very limited. What, what do you comment on, you know, the lessons that you're learning uh, from this emergency and looking into the future, uh, what lessons can we take? Um, no, thank you for the very good question, and thank you for the excellent questions from the audience. Uh, so first of all, regarding uh, vaccine um, equity, I think it's very interesting. Um, quite a few of us were very active during the Ebola uh, outbreak uh, in Western Africa. One of the lessons learned, I think, is the importance of global leadership. Looking back, it's already seven or eight years ago, back then it was a very different environment in terms of the global leadership and type of leaders and time of, type of discourse and the sense of joint responsibility in terms of countries supporting each other. Now, unfortunately, over the past two years, we learned that, you know, the discourse has changed and many of the leaders and many of the countries are first and foremost prioritizing their own needs, which is extremely unfortunate. All of the global structures that have been put in place, um, we already mentioned those, Gavi and COVAX and support with different multilaterals and different bilateral uh, donors, did a lot of great work, but at the end of the day, they really depend on the goodwill of governments that have the sufficient means in order to procure those vaccines. And there's no mechanism that can actually force those governments, apart from ourselves as citizens, to try to hold them accountable and to understand that until globally everybody is vaccinated, 
nobody is going to be safe. And we actually saw that very recently during the emergence of the most recent variant of consent, the Omicron, that even in countries that had a very high level of coverage, actually the number of cases has spiked so quickly. And the reason is that that variant of concern managed to develop and evade immunity because there were still large numbers of non-vaccinated and non-protected people in other parts of the world. And today, in this era, with the massive amount of you know, global travel and outbreaks very quickly become pandemics like, uh, like COVID-19. And we really need, as global citizens and as citizens in our own countries, to hold governments accountable uh, to that. So that, I think, is the first important lesson which is linked to the equity in the distribution of vaccines. Nevertheless, gradually we are doing better and better, and I think it is commendable the progress that has been made in terms of making vaccines available to communities and beneficiaries across the world, but there's still a lot more that needs to be done, and I think that we will be seeing more and more of that being done in the coming months. Thank you very much. Just if I can add just one more thing is okay. that one of the things that we need to recognize as well is that very rapidly the world had to move from you know zero capacity of production. Imagine, there were no COVID-19 vaccines, to very rapidly producing multiple types of vaccines in massive amounts of billions of doses and distributing them around the world. And that was a great, that was a major challenge that I think, I'm not sure that all of us really recognize the scope of that uh, challenge. So there's also a lot of success stories in terms of making these vaccines available very rapidly. Although, of course, there's a lot of scope for improvement. And as I said, I'm very confident that we will see that improvement globally. And also here in Kenya, uh, very rapidly, as Dr. Akwale has shared with us, with the excellent leadership of the Ministry of Health and other branches uh, of the government at county level as well, I'm sure that we will see that complete mobilization of governments, of partners of the government and of communities to make those vaccines available in an equitable manner, even within Kenya. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Wallman. We have already overrun, can you believe it? And it's almost like we're just warming up, right? And unfortunately, we can't take any more questions from you. But, you know, there's so many things that are coming up in this discussion that could take hours and hours and hours of uh, discussion. Um, but I would just like to come back to our panelists very briefly and just, um, uh, just to give two, two, two points, you know, in point form. Uh, when you look into the future with the lessons that we are learning uh, in the response uh, to COVID, uh, in, in terms of vaccine development, are you optimistic or pessimistic? And what is what the one key area that needs a lot of work? Okay, thank you very much. Um, having been in the vaccine development space on the global forum, I think with COVID coming into play, we are very optimistic in terms of the way vaccine development for the future is going to be. Thank you very much. And what is the one thing that, as a researcher, you think must really change, the most important thing that needs to change? The thing that has changed and must continue changing is that the boundaries has to be, have to be brought down. We are one village called the Global Village. Thank you very much, Dr. Yeah. Ogutu. And Dr. Dokok, optimistic? Pessimistic? Oh, uh, you have to be optimistic because, you know, optimism <coughs> drives the future and the only virtue of pessimism or pessimist is that maybe they were right. Um, <laughs> yeah, so you have to be optimistic. Can I, can I make a couple of technical comments uh, very quickly because we didn't cover them? The issue of vaccine efficacy, in other words, the proportion of people protected by a vaccine it is important to remember, it's very relevant to malaria, that 
a vaccine that is imperfect, even you know, only protects 35% of people, can still be very useful in the context of an overall public health response. So people mustn't go away thinking, oh, the vaccine doesn't work, it's hopeless. If we had a vaccine of 50% efficacy for HIV, we'd use it in certain populations. The question of coverage is, is a complicated one because it's specific to the virus and to the vaccine. It may have to be very high. I mean, for measles, it's about 95% coverage that's required to get population protection. I really appreciated Dr. Wallman's comments about politics, because we're in a very different world from, you're right, I hadn't thought of it that way, in a very different world, much more polarized. Um, although the Ebola response that was so, such a sign of solidarity, was also out of self-interest, because there was genuine fear in the, in the, in the North. Um, and finally, we didn't mention long COVID that you know, about 5% of people infected seem to have some post-viral syndrome that we really don't understand and could be quite incapacitating. And with, with you know, hundreds of millions of people infected in the world, we don't know what that means. And uh, all the more reason, what's the most important thing? Vaccinate the world, vaccinate the world, keep going. Indeed. And of course, we have a background of natural immunity now as well. Am I optimistic? You have to be optimistic. You have to be optimistic. Yeah. I can guess that Dr. Ahwale is going to say he is optimistic, but I will not preempt them. So we will start from Dr. Wallman and coming this way. Uh, optimistic, pessimistic, and what is the one thing that you think is the most important that thing that must change? I have a four-year-old daughter, so I must be optimistic. <laughs> um, because, yeah, otherwise uh, I would not be able to be a good uh, dad to her. So I'm very optimistic regarding COVID-19 and in general. If for me the most important lesson is the importance of public health, the importance of vaccines as a public good, and the need to strengthen the health system everywhere. Strengthening the health system is so fundamental, and it is a matter of real fundamental human rights of everyone, everywhere, and hopefully because of the COVID-19 pandemic, that's going to be the biggest lesson of the politicians and of the global leaders, because ourselves as public health professionals, we're already convinced. We don't need to be convinced. But the ones who are the decision makers, the ones who decide regarding the allocation of resources, they're the ones that hopefully will be convinced, and based on the lessons of COVID-19, health system will be strengthened in an equitable manner everywhere. And we're not talking about highly sophisticated tertiary medical centers with, you know, uh, uh, all sorts of sophisticated equipment items. We're talking about primary health care as a foundation for universal health coverage, including the immunization systems. That is my dream. Thank you very much. And uh, to you, Lolem, um, when you look at, you know, political leadership, you know, communities, are you more optimistic now, uh, given the COVID response, or pessimistic? And what is the one thing that you feel must really change and change now uh, when we're confronting COVID-19 and even future pandemics? Um, certainly optimistic. Um, and then for the second part, actually, um, Aaron took my response. I was going to focus on health systems resilience. But, um, you know, when we look at uh, political leadership, I think one thing that we do, that we learned and we did well um, as a continent in the beginning of the response was that we were extremely unified in our response. Um, we did ensure um, under the leadership of Africa CDC um, that there was some form of like concerted distribution. We attempted to, to raise funds, to mobilize resources, et cetera, et cetera. So I hope we can build on those, um, those approaches um, that seemed to take off 
and we can actually institutionalize those approaches. So for the next pandemic, there's a continent-wide uh, response as we saw this time around, and we're able to also decentralize that response to regions, to our national um, spaces, and even all the way down to our communities. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Lolim. And finally, Dr. Huale, I think I'll tweak the question a little bit for you, um, because I'm not sure whether you're speaking to us as Dr. Huale, the expert, or as a representative of policymakers in this country. What is your biggest frustration as you, um, you know, mount this response against COVID-19? And what would you like to see change in the community in Kenya? Thank you. I'll answer that. And But first, I must say I'm super optimistic. <laughs> uh, super you. optimistic in this country because, as you know now, we've even formed a Kenya Biovax Limited, a company that is going to manufacture not only vaccines but all biologicals. Based on the lessons that we learned, we must be self-sustaining. I have been able to sit with the team that is working on Kenya Biovax, super scientists here in Kenya. In fact, at one time you feel like you, you, you are sitting in the same room with Einstein, that we only hadn't discovered them. So you'll be hearing a lot about that. And global, there's a lot of global interest in partnership and everybody who is coming, the good thing is that we are using our resources and we are able to continue forging those partnerships on our interests. Now, my frustrations. One. One. The biggest one. The biggest one is overall coordination. I think one of the things that we learn when we have a pandemic and the action is really at the community level is to get the, the, the shots into the arms of the people who need it. But we come with structures at a global and national level that you spend so much time saying, do this, let's do this, let's get, before you bring this, let's do this. It really takes time to do that. I'm hoping we have more efficient systems that would focus on where, what we need to do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to our panelists. I have learned so much. It is so broad. It is so hard to summarize everything. Uh, but I would really like to thank Dr. Yaron Wallman uh, from UNICEF, uh, Lolem Gong from AMREF Health Africa, Dr. Willis Akwale from uh, the, uh, the, the, the Kenyan government, uh, from the Ministry of Health, Dr. Kevin de Kock, uh, infectious diseases expert, and uh, finally, Dr. Benhads Ogutu from the Kenya Medical Research Institute. Institute. Thank you so much for your insights. Another round of applause for them, please. Merci beaucoup, Anne. Merci. Um, do you think if we can have the answer of, of the question by telephone, maybe? During this time, I just wanted to, to tell you something. I was very frustrated because uh, Dr. De Cox spoiled the film from the beginning, saying, that's biology. So I was waiting for a reaction <laughs> from you. No, that's money. And I could ask now, but it's too late. I could ask, if it's biology, does it mean that we could have had this uh, COVID vaccine without this amount of money and without this effort? So I know I am a bit bad. I would like, because, um, because I'm not a physician, I'm not a medical doctor, I would like to invite you <laughs> to have now a French cocktail, a Kenyan cocktail, and some very good French wine, which I'm not a medical doctor, which is maybe a vaccine to a sadness, <laughs> whatever. Anyway, it was fabulous, really fabulous. Thank you so much, and thank you so much, all of you. We have the result? Do we have the result? Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, I saw social media. <laughs> Fantastic. So health organizations, many of which are represented here, uh, very well done. Okay. Thank you. At least there's some faith in us. Yeah, well, there's some. I'm being optimistic. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for, to all of you. Okay. Thank you for the questions Merci that were asked. Have a lovely evening. <laughs> <laughs>